There are many different types of splints, which are used to stabilize fractures and other traumatic injuries. In this video, we will demonstrate the general technique used in the application of both plaster and prefabricated fiberglass splints. Specific techniques for various anatomical regions are covered in separate chapters. Splints are not the same as casts. Unlike casts, splints are not circumferential and thus accommodate swelling that is often associated with acute orthopedic injuries. Casts are stronger than splints and are generally used for long-term immobilization once edema has subsided. In this video, only the application of splints is demonstrated. Prior to splinting, obtain and review the appropriate radiographic studies. Two views of the fractured bone should be obtained. If there is significant displacement or misalignment, a reduction maneuver may be necessary prior to splint application. Carefully examine the extremity for any injury to the skin, which may indicate an open fracture. Open fractures require emergent orthopedic consultation as well as early irrigation and debridement to prevent infections. Additionally, perform and document a detailed neurovascular examination prior to splinting. This includes an assessment of capillary refill, peripheral pulses, and motor and sensory function. Begin by measuring the length of the splint by placing a section of cast padding along the extremity. Next, roll out four layers of the padding on a bedside table. The first three layers should lie directly on one another. Two strips of padding are used to make the top layer, and these are offset from the center. The overhanging edges will be used to fold over the plaster. Appropriate padding is essential in making a good splint. Padding prevents the hardened plaster from injuring the underlying tissues and bony prominences. Additional padding may be used if desired. However, as more layers are added, the immobilization offered by the plaster is lessened. Next, roll out layers of plaster bandages over the cast padding. For smaller splints, usually 8 to 10 layers of plaster are used. For larger splints, 10 to 15 layers may be required. Additional plaster may be used if clinically indicated. However, be aware that thicker splints are heavier and often uncomfortable for the patient and are more likely to cause plaster burns. Soak the layers of plaster in a bucket filled with room temperature water. Once saturated, raise the plaster above the bucket, firmly holding each end of the roll in your hands. Remove excess water by allowing the plaster to fold upon itself and then gently squeezing the layers. Do not use hot water to soak the plaster bandages. Heat is released when the plaster is exposed to water and plaster burns may occur if hot water is used. Place the wet plaster onto the cast padding and smooth the surface by running your hands over it. This causes the layers to form a single mass of plaster. Fold the overhanging edges of the cast padding over the plaster. This single layer of padding is used to prevent the plaster from adhering to the elastic bandage. Apply the newly constructed splint to the extremity. Gently mold the plaster to the body using the palms of your hands. Next, begin to roll an elastic bandage around the splint. In general, Wrapping should proceed in a distal to proximal direction. However, it may be necessary to begin toward the center of the splint to secure it, if an assistance is not available. Overlap each wrap by 50% and apply a modest degree of tension to the roll as you progress. Once the splint has been applied, gently shape it and mold it to the extremity using the palm of your hand. This must be done before the plaster has set which usually occurs in about 10 minutes. Avoid using your fingertips to mold the splint. This may cause indentations in the plaster, which may lead to pressure sores. Finally, perform a post-splinting neurovascular exam 
including capillary refill and motor and sensory function. A variety of prefabricated fiberglass splinting materials are available. In general, these splints contain multiple layers of fiberglass surrounded by padding material. Note that there are two distinct sides to the splint. This side is padded, and it is essential to place it next to the patient's skin. The other side is not padded, and is intended to prevent the fiberglass from sticking to the elastic bandage. Hold the splint next to the extremity to measure the required length. If the splint is too long, it can either be cut to size or folded back on itself. Next, soak the splint in room temperature water. As with plaster splints, hot water must not be used in order to avoid splint-related burns. Place the saturated splint on the bed and run your hands over the surface to assure that the water has equally penetrated all layers of fiberglass. Now, apply the splint. If necessary, fold any excess length of the splint back on itself. Gently mold the fiberglass to the extremity using the palms of your hands. Next, begin to roll an elastic bandage around the splint. In general, wrapping should proceed in a distal to proximal direction. However, it may be necessary to begin toward the center of the splint to secure it if an assistance is not available. Overlap each wrap by 50% and apply a modest degree of tension to the roll as you progress. Once the elastic bandage has been applied, additional positioning or molding may be performed before the fiberglass cures. Repeat a thorough neurovascular examination of the affected extremity after the splint has been applied. This examination should include capillary refill and motor and sensory function.